How's everybody doing this evening? We'll try that again. How's everybody doing this evening? That's a little better. Uh, it's going to be an interesting night because what I want to do, rather than give you a formal lecture, is just offer some reflections on the Civil Rights Movement and the Civil War. And I say anytime you can put the Supremes up on the big screen, go for it. So we will be doing uh, some reflections today just talking about the connection between these two important turning points in US history. I wanted to begin with you by actually taking a look at a letter that was written by a Missouri black soldier by the name of Spotswood Rice in uh, 1864. Uh, we actually have copies of this for you that we're going to be sending around. But he wrote two letters in, in 1864, in September of 1864, one letter to his daughter's owners and one letter to his daughters. So it's a pretty interesting moment in a lot of ways because if we look at Spotswood on a timeline, he's writing this letter in 1864 in between the Emancipation Proclamation, 1863, and the 13th Amendment, 1865. So it's in this period when if we ask the question, is slavery over? Oh, well, it's complicated. Uh, it certainly is on its last legs. One certainly could project forward, as Spotswood Rice does, that this is the beginning of the end for the institution, for the peculiar institution. But there were no guarantees in 1864 that slavery had to be abolished in the way that it ultimately was abolished by the 13th Amendment to the Constitution. So this letter becomes very important in a couple of ways in, in allowing us to examine the significance of this moment. Um, I want to begin with the letter that he writes. I'm on page 13 to his daughters, uh, and he says to them, my children, I take my pen in hand to write you a few lines to let you know that I have not forgot you and that I want to see you as bad as ever. Now, my dear children, I want you to be contented with whatever may be your lots. Be assured that I will have you if it costs me my life. On the 28th of the month, 800 white and 800 black soldiers expect to start up the river to Glasgow, and we're, in, we're to be generaled by a general that will give me both of you. And when they come, I expect to be with them and I expect to get both of you in return. Don't be uneasy, my children, I expect to have you. If digs don't give you up, this government will. And I feel confident that I will get you, um, and I feel confident that I will get you. Your Miss Kitty said I tried to steal you, but I let her know that God never intended for a man to steal his own flesh and blood. If I had no confidence in God, I could have confidence in her. But as it is, if I ever had any confidence in her, I have now none and never expect to have. And I want her to remember if she meets me with 10,000 soldiers, she will meet her enemy. I once thought that I had some respect for them, but now my respect is worn out and I have no sympathy for slaveholders. And as for her Christianity, I expect the devil has such in hell. You can tell her from me that she's the first Christian that ever heard say a man could steal his own child, especially out of human bondage. You can tell her that she can go and hold on to as long as she can. I never expect her again to let you come to me because I know the devil has got her hot set against it. That, that now, my dear children, I'm going to close my letter to you. Give my love to all inquiring friends. Tell them that we are well and that we, um, and that we want to see them very much. And Cora and Mary receive the greater part of it yourselves. And don't think hard of us for not sending you anything. I, your father, have plenty for you when I see you. Send Noah, um, Spot and Noah send their love as well. Oh, my dear children, how I do want to see you, Spotswood Rice. It's a pretty powerful letter because here is this soldier in 1864, in the midst of this campaign, writing his daughters to let them know, A, that he's thinking about them, that he's concerned about them, that ultimately his horse in his race, the reason that he's interested in this war, his reason for fighting is to achieve their freedom. It's also interesting because he sent some messages, some pretty clear messages to their owner in this letter. Um, in the midst of the chaos that occasions the war, when you have large numbers of African Americans running away to union lines, self-emancipating. Here's a father saying to his daughters, don't go anywhere. Don't do anything. I know where you are. I know where to find you. This is an expression of family, but it's also an expression, and I think this is very important, of Spotswood, Spotswood Rice's confidence in the United States government and his earnest belief that this war at its core is about slavery and that it's going to mean that not only is he going to get his children, but he's going to be able to exercise all the rights of citizenship that go along with that. Uh, having said that, I want to go to page 14. This is the letter that he writes to his daughter's owner. This is Miss Kitty. Uh, 
I received a letter from Caroline telling me that you say I tried to plunder my child away from you. Now, I want you to understand that Mary is my child, and she is a God-given right of my own. And you may hold on to her as long as you can, but I want you to remember this one thing, that the longer you keep my child from me, the longer you will have to burn in hell, and the quicker you will get there. For we are now making up about 1,000 black troops, and when we come, we want to go come through Glasgow. And when we come, woe be to copperhead rebels and to slaveholding rebels, for we don't expect to leave them root nor branch. But we think, however, that we that have children in the hands of you devils, we will try your virtues that day we enter Glasgow. And I want you to understand, Kitty Diggs, that wherever you and I meet, we are enemies to each other. I offered once to pay you $40 for my own child. But I'm glad now that you did not accept it. Just hold on now as long as you can, and the worse it will be for you. You never in your life before I came down here did you give my children anything. Not anything. Not even a dollar's worth of expenses. Now you call my children your property. Not so with me. My children is my own, and I expect to get them. And when I get ready to come after Mary, I will have a power and authority to bring her away and to execute vengeance on them that holds my child. You will then know how to talk to me. And I'm sure you'll know how to talk right, too. I want you now to just hold on if, if, to her if you want to, if your conscience tells you to go that road and what it will bring to you, Kitty Diggs. I have no fears about getting Mary out of your hands. This whole government gives cheer to me, and you cannot help yourself. Again, interesting letter written in 1864 because when Spotswood Rice is talking about how the power and authority to bring away his children and execute vengeance on them that holds his child, What's giving him that power and authority? Certainly there's no 13th Amendment. There's no 14th Amendment. There's no 15th Amendment. There's no Civil Rights Act of 1866 or Civil Rights Act of 1875 or Civil Rights Act of 1964 or Voting Rights Act of 1965 or 24th Amendment. There's just this little piece of paper called the Emancipation Proclamation. When we talk about the importance of Lincoln, the significance of Lincoln, sometimes we get lost in the symbols. I love this cartoon that was produced in 2008 uh, when Barack Obama was running for president. And a cartoonist had one simple point. It shows Barack Obama seated at the front of a, kind of busts that. And the cartoonist's point was, this is in some sense the culmination of the civil rights movement. Rosa Parks refused to give up her seat. Now you've got an Af African-American occupying the White House. And it's also interesting that what kind of bus is it? School bus. So the cartoonist Adam Zeiglis managed to get Rosa Parks, Brown versus Board of Education, and the election of the nation's first black president all into one political cartoon to make a grand statement about this being the coming, the coming of full circle of African-Americans claiming citizenship. I've got some issues with this, but I'll talk more about those in just a second. I want to begin here with John Hope Franklin, who writes in the opening of every edition of the American History series. This is especially important for young people. Every generation writes its own history for the reason that it tends to see the past in the foreshortened perspective of its own experience. We're all influenced by our own biographies, our own historical moments. And sometimes what we see in the past, what we want to see in the past, what we write about, what we think we see, is conditioned by the moments in which we live. I say that's important because we find ourselves now in the midst of what I would consider to be a period of historical amnesia when it comes to the importance of the civil rights movement and also the importance of the Civil War. And I say that because there was a lot of conversation in the aftermath of the election of Barack Obama of a post-racial America, about the fact that we don't need entitlement programs like affirmative action, that we have progressed as a society and we're no longer in a situation or a position where we need to talk about racism as such, that that disease, that evil no longer exists. It's interesting because in some sense, in a place like this, one of the authors that's written about this, Jacqueline Dowd Hall, who teaches at the University of North Carolina, Journal of American History 2005 says, the civil rights movement circulates through American memory and forms and through channels that are at once powerful, dangerous, and hotly contested. And there's one simple message that she's making there. History matters, the way that we remember history matters, the spaces that we remember history in matter, the people that we remember matter, and what motives we ascribe to them matter. She continues, civil rights memorials jostle at the South's ubiquitous monuments to its Confederate past. Exemplary scholarship and documentaries abound, and participants have produced wave after wave of autobiographical accounts, at least 200 to date, 
Images of the movement appear and reappear every year on Martin Luther King Jr. Day and during Black History Month, but this is important. Remembrance, remembrance is always a form of forgetting. Because there's something that we're leaving out when we claim to be remembering or capturing the essence of this movement, and it boils down to a soundbite. I have a dream. Or a soundbite. The Emancipation Proclamation. She continues. And the dominant narrative of the civil rights movement distilled from history and memory, twisted by ideology and political contestation, and embedded in heritage tours, museums, and public rituals, textbooks, and various artifacts of mass culture, distorts, distorts and suppresses as much as it reveals. A couple of years ago, Glenn Beck, the conservative talk, talk show host, said that we needed to, or that Americans needed to reclaim the civil rights movement. He says, it's been so distorted and turned upside down, it's an abomination. I was listening to Mr. Beck, and I'm thinking, what civil rights movement is Mr. Beck talking about? This ought to be very interesting. What does he mean? He wanted to have a march on Washington, August 28, 2010, to reclaim that dream. And again, I'm asking myself, well, what does he mean by the dream? We have to unpack the meaning of the dream. When we talk about other manifestations of this, uh, Martin Luther King Day has been reduced to, of all things, a white sale. I think that's funny. No one else thinks that's funny. But in some sense, Lincoln was reduced to a sale a long time ago. Remembrance is always a form of forgetting. This is Jackie Hall's point, that at the core, there's something about those historical moments, those turning points that we've lost in creating shells of these individuals rather than talking about the history that they made. And these political uses of the past take place on both the left and on the right. So I can pick on Glenn Beck, but I can also be very critical of Barack Obama in consciously engaging and trying to use the image of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King and to tie his campaign and his legacy uh, to the legacy of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King. All these are problematic. They're problematic we saw very dramatically this summer, this uh, past summer, when the United States Supreme Court in Shelby County versus Holder decided to gut the Voting Rights Act of 1965, and the reaction of Congressman John Lewis from Georgia. John Lewis was a member of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. John Lewis was part of the Freedom Rides. John Lewis, who got beat up asked the Supreme Court point blank. I was disappointed because what I think the court did today is stab the Voting Rights Act of 1965 right in its very heart. It's a major setback. We may not have people being beaten today. Maybe they're not being denied the right to participate, to register to vote. They're not being chased by police dogs or trampled by horses. But in the 11 states of the old Confederacy, and even in some states outside of the South, there has been a systemic, deliberate attempt to take us back to another period. We continue. And these men that voted to strip the Voting Rights Act of its power, they never stood in immovable lines. They never had to pass a so-called literacy test. It took us almost 200 years to get where we are today. So will it take another 100 years to fix, to change it? Lincoln, if we talk about the Emancipation Proclamation, understood that he wrote that in the shadow of the Dred Scott decision, the power of the United States Supreme Court. The civil rights cases of 1883, Plessy versus Ferguson, these damning decisions by the United States Supreme Court that wouldn't be overturned until Brown versus Board of Education. But if we simply make it a soundbite, what we lose is all that history, and what we lose is a connection to what John Lewis is saying, imploring that the United States Supreme Court understand. He continues, my message to the members of the United States Supreme Court is remember, don't forget our recent history. Walk in our shoes. Come and walk in our shoes. It's funny because Spotswood Rice talks about 800 white and 800 black soldiers, and John Lewis was part of a nonviolent interracial army in SNCC, white and black college students who committed themselves to the idea that segregation was wrong, that was against the princ principles of the United States government, that it was unconstitutional, and they were willing to give their bodies in the same way that Spotswood Rice was willing to give his life in order to ensure that liberty would endure. He concludes. Come and walk in the shoes of those three young men that died in Mississippi, Schwerner, Cheney, and Goodman. Registering blacks to vote in 1964. Walk in the shoes of those who walked across that bridge, the Edmund Pettus Bridge, Bloody Sunday, March 7, 1965. 
He says, I didn't think that on that day that when President Johnson signed the Voting Rights Act that I would live to see five members of the United States Supreme Court undone what President Johnson did with those pens. And part of what he's saying, and this is particularly true for young people, is it's a living history that we're talking about because the assumption is that once it happens, it can't be done, but the only way to ensure, Patrick Henry said it best, that you're gonna have liberty is if you're willing to see it as an everyday commitment to making sure that the hands of time aren't turned back, that people don't forget the struggles that have come before, to remember how hard it was for women and African Americans to gain the right to vote, to remember that our democracy, and this is very true, Christopher Eisgruber from Princeton University says it best, we expect that our democracy will be both democratic and just, but can democracy, can justice and, and, and democracy coexist? Because there's always an element of unfairness unless you keep before people the principles that undergird our democracy. I love this cartoon. The South, the Supreme Court done washed away my racism, washed away my history. John Lewis, in his own way, was trying to get us to understand the importance of these two important watersheds in U.S. history, these two important turning points. The United States Senate, when they wanted to define what U.S. history was, says we see U.S. history as significant constitutional, political, intellectual, economic, and foreign policy trends and issues that have shaped the course of American history, key episodes, turning points, and leading figures. That is the Civil War. That is the Civil Rights Movement. That is the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King. That is Rosa Parks. That is the white David Eisenhower in Little Rock. That is 1863, Abraham Lincoln, and the decision to issue the Emancipation Proclamation in the aftermath of Gettysburg, even though he's written it in September of 1862. These are the turning points. These are the moments that we're called to remember. And all their complexity. Because let's be clear, when we look at Dio Plaza in 1963, November of 1963, One of the reasons that Johnson is so successful in pushing his civil rights agenda is that he has the bully pulpit of a dead president in order to build that agenda upon. It doesn't take anything away from Kennedy to say that. It's not unfair to Johnson to say that. It's not to say that Johnson didn't have his own desire to be remembered, but it does say that he had this powerful weapon of saying, this is where Kennedy was headed. This is what Kennedy was talking about in the summer of 1963. This is what Kennedy felt about the March on Washington. This is where the administration was going. And I mean to see this through with the passage of this momentous legislation, a Civil Rights Act of 1964, so you don't have to have people sitting in at restaurants, sitting out, for basic constitutional rights. It's interesting because the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King that summer, in his famous letter from a Birmingham jail, channels none other than Abraham Lincoln. He says, but though I was initially disappointed as to be character, actually I'm gonna skip down from this a little bit. He says, in Abraham Lincoln, this nation cannot survive half slave and half free. Perhaps the South and the nation in the world are in dire need of creative extremists. You're gonna call me an extremist, and I'm an extremist in the same way that Lincoln was an extremist. Because what I see is that what we have is a system which in its dichotomization of race has made our democracy unstable, which has put it at risk. We find that concept articulated by Lincoln November 19th, 1863. And if we look at the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, again, 100 years later, I'm happy to join with you today in what will go down in history as the greatest demonstration for freedom in the history of our nation. Five score years ago, a great American in whose symbolic symbol or whose symbolic shadow we stand signed the Emancipation Proclamation. These two watershed moments coming together, 100 years separated and yet tied in their purpose, tied in their legacy. There's a reason that Martin Luther King talks about the Civil War's unfinished business. Because he says the South may have lost the military battle, 
But at the end of the day, they won the peace. David Blight says essentially the same thing in Race for Union in the Civil War. They may have lost on the battlefield, but they won the peace because the nation that emerged from the Civil War wasn't a nation of equality, wasn't a nation where the principles of the Declaration of Independence, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. It wasn't a nation where that was the standard. It was a nation where what the Confederates fought for was the standard. A nation where you had segregation. A nation where you had the arbitrary separation of people based on race. Alexander Stevens in his famous Cornerstone speech talked about this. This was the alternative vision. And in some sense, this is the vision that won. Alexander Stevens said, uh, talking about the virtues of what was going to be this Confederate States of America, all the great principles of the Magna Carta are retained. No citizen is deprived of life, liberty, or property, but by the judgment of his peers under the laws of the land, the great principles of religious liberty, which was the honor and pride of the old Constitution, is still maintained and secured. All the essentials of the old Constitution, which have endeared it to the hearts of the American people, have been preserved and perpetuated. That remained true for the vast majority of white Americans and not for African Americans. That remained true for the vast majority of white Americans, white males, and not for women. That remained true for the vast majority of white male Americans and not Native Americans. This was not the great revolution. And so the shadow of Lincoln is profound. And it's not just because the speech is delivered on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial. Say this to you. What you see coming out of the Civil War is what I like to call the six degrees of segregation. And these are things that at their core rob African Americans of the very attributes of citizenship that we all expect to associate with citizenship in a democracy. So, residential segregation, the right to live where one wants to live. Segregation in education. Segregation in places of public accommodation. Jim Crow justice disfranchisement and voting rights, unfair labor practices. And yet you've got a 14th Amendment in 1868 that glaringly says, no state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States. And yet, in the most basic, sometimes in the most dramatic and scandalous ways, that's what you found not only in the Deep South and places like Mississippi, Alabama, Florida, and Louisiana, but even places like Pennsylvania, Connecticut, and Illinois. What did African Americans want? Preamble is pretty clear about citizenship. We the people, in order to form a more perfect union, so on and so forth, you know that language. And yet this political cartoon from the Civil War laid out the problem that existed between 1787 and 1860. No matter what African Americans did to try to claim a piece of citizenship, we know the problems that assaulted free people of color throughout the United States. No matter what they did, they found themselves in some sense trapped by the paradox of 1787, by these values that affirm liberty and yet at the same time deny liberty. And there you have it in this cartoon. A large black man takes on the role of Samson trying to pull down the pillars. 1776, the revolution, and the right 1860 between them is a signed label constitution. Before 1860, no matter what the slave did, it was nearly impossible for him to end slavery. We see that dramatically in Dred Scott, but then comes this little piece of paper, the Emancipation Proclamation. Don't get me wrong, I'm not trying to elevate Lincoln to some stature that is beyond. What I'm saying is that that is an important moment. Keep in mind that W.E.B. Du Bois in 1903 complains in the souls of black folks that the problem of the 20th century will be the problem of the color line. And the problem of the color line is really a problem of citizenship. What he's saying is the problem isn't that black people are black. The problem is because they're black, they're denied equal protection of the law. They're denied those things that we associate with the 14th Amendment. They can't live where they want to live. They can't sit where they want to sit on a bus. They can't do any of those things. And that's what makes the problem of the 20th century the problem of the color line. If we look at this, the whole notion of African Americans just as people, uh, keep in mind if we talk about the Springfield race riot of 1908, what starts that? 
is two African-Americans in jail, Jim Crow justice, one for a rape that he doesn't commit, the other for a murder, which at the very least, if it, even if you were gonna execute him and ultimately they do execute him, he was entitled to due process of law, that is a trial, a, 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 an attribute of the 14th Amendment. So even there we can, can link this history back to this important period just after the Civil War and this turning point, these watershed moments. But we the people for African-Americans has meant something different over time. It means one thing in 1789 when blacks aren't included as the people. When Thomas Jefferson whacked his philosophical about whether African-Americans actually have the capacity for critical thought that he finds. You know, he thought, well, Phyllis Wheatley may write a poem, but is she really thinking critically? It means something very different in 1830, in the age of Jackson, when you have the expansion of the vote for air and vote democracy. But again, African-Americans are cut out. It means something very different in 1870 when ultimately here you've got the 15th Amendment that says the right to vote shall not be abridged or denied based on race, color, or previous condition of servitude. And yet it said nothing about literacy, poll tax, grandfather cause, liter and all the other devices that were employed in the South to deny African-Americans the right to vote. It's going to mean something very different in 1920 when you extend the suffrage to women. And yet you have to ask the question, what does that mean for African-American women? who are doubly bound by race and sex in their attempt to exercise the right to vote. It's going to mean something very different with the passage of the Voting Rights Act of 1965. And thus, in this very long history, all of a sudden, what John Lewis is saying to us in, in uh, 2013 about the importance of the Supreme Court's gutting of the Civil Rights Act of 1965 becomes apparent. These aren't baby steps. This was a long process. And to wipe it out with the stroke of a pen, in a post-racial America because you got a Latina on the Supreme Court and an African-American in the White House for him was problematic. Because if given the chance, that political chicanery, those same devices that we saw emerge in the aftermath of the Civil War, and, but that would never happen today. We would never, do, remember those pregnant chads in Florida in 2000? Ha ha. I wanna say this to you very quickly. If we look at language, rhetoric, it's important to note that Barack Obama got in trouble during uh, the campaign in 2008 because Hillary Clinton claimed that he borrowed certain lines and phrases from Deval Patrick. Now, I love this because this is important. I want to share this with you. I think it's great. Deval Patrick said, don't tell me, or Obama said, don't tell me words don't matter. I have a dream, just words. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, just words. We have nothing to fear but fear itself, just words, just speeches. And Deval Patrick's speech was, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, just words. We have nothing to fear but fear itself. Ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country, just words. I have a dream, just words. And Hillary said, I got you, Obama. And Obama's response to her, I thought, was clever. As a professor, I still would have given him a bad grade, but I would have given points for creativity. <laughs> what he said is, Hillary, there are some concepts in American history that you can't own because they compel people to believe that our democracy can be just and it moves them to action. There are some things that people say that you can't copyright because they belong to our DNA, our dreams, how we nurture those dreams and ultimately how we act upon those dreams when we feel our democracy is threatened. So no one owns the Declaration of Independence. Nobody can own the Emancipation Proclamation, not the sentiments, because they compel people to action. I love that because in some sense, Shirley Chisholm, I don't know why that's not coming up, you should be able to see what she said, uh, ended up running for president, the first African-American uh, to run for president, and the first woman to run for president, and she did this in the 1970s, and she says, and I don't know why we can't read that, I am going to see if I can go out and see it, if it'll come up. That's always dangerous in a presentation to mess around with technology. And it did not make it any better. So, what we are going to do, there it is. Let's try this again. She says, I was the first what? I want to be clear, because I described her in one way. I talked about her as being an African-American and a woman. She doesn't describe herself that way. She describes herself as a what? So at the core, this is about citizenship. 
I was the first American citizen to be elected to Congress in spite of the double drawbacks of being female and having skin darkened by melanin. When you put it that way, it sounds like a what? I love this because this is what, in some sense, Michelle Obama got in a lot of trouble for in 2008, when she said, this is the first time in my adult life that I've been proud of my country. And people said, how could you ever say that? And all I said is, that's what Shirley Chisholm said. That it seems ridiculous that if it's a meritocracy and it's a democracy, that you would ever have any questions about this, or that we'd be surprised when a person of color achieves a certain milestone, because we would just assume, she continues, in a just and free society, it would be foolish that I am a national figure because I was the first person in 192 years to be at once a congressman, black, and a woman proves, I think, that our society is not yet either just or free. I got lot in a lot of trouble for this. Uh, <laughs> Most people, when you suggest that Thomas Jefferson was a Black Panther, immediately go to violence, and so it must be a violent comparison. If you look at some of the ideas expressed by Jefferson, and you look at some of the ideas expressed by the Black Panthers, suddenly you have this moment where you go, ultimately both parties are talking about citizenship in their own way. One party talking about it from a philosophical standpoint, where he believes that his liberty is being threatened or uh, uh, infringed upon by Great Britain, and a group of African Americans coming out of Oakland who were Southern migrants and came to Oakland and said, we couldn't exercise our rights to uh, liberty in Oak Grove, Louisiana, in Texas, and then we came to the West Coast and we can't do it in California, so now our decision is to stand and fight. We're gonna have this 10-point program. But let's look at what these two say. Uh, Jefferson, all human beings are created equal and endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. Governments are established to protect the rights of citizens. The right to work the land is a fundamental human right. Consequently, a state that allows private ownership of land must provide employment to those who do not have such property. That is the Panthers, one, two, and three points of their 10-point program. It makes people uncomfortable. <laughs> Panthers, universal edu um, um, Jefferson, excuse me. Universal education is the most effective means of preserving democracy and good government. Panthers, we want education for people that exposes the true nature of this American society. We believe in an educational system that will give to people a knowledge of self. If a man does not have knowledge of himself and his position in society and the world, then he has little chance to relate to anything else. Scary. But it's where the Panthers wind up that I think is the most, illustrate, uh, the most uh, dramatic illustration. The Panthers wind up there. This is the scary, revolutionary Black Panther Party for self-defense. Where do they wind up? They sum up in point number 10, we want land, bread, housing, education, clothing, justice, and peace. In other words, we want an end to the six degrees of segregation. And they conclude, when in the course of human events it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with another, they are quoting Jefferson, they are quoting the Declaration of Independence, they are quoting that language because they know that every American knows that because it's in our DNA. And when we hear it, we immediately let our guard down and say, well, there must be, we, we gotta, we at least have to, we at least have to listen. We're here to talk about the Civil Rights Act of 1964. But I want to begin by looking at the Civil Rights Act of 1875. Because the interesting thing is, we wouldn't have needed a Civil Rights Act of 1964. The nation wouldn't have needed it if there weren't these attempts to undercut those protections that had been extended by these three constitutional amendments, a failed Civil Rights Act of 1866, and then a Civil Rights Act of 1875, which is ultimately gutted by the United States Supreme Court in a case called the uh, Civil Rights Cases of 1883. I had to read this to you. Whereas it's essential to just government, we recognize the equality of all men what? Help me out and hold that it's the duty of government and its dealings with the people to meet out equal and exact to all of whatever race, color, or pers persuasion, religious or political. Now I want to say something here. What have they done so far? Nothing. This is just the preamble to the act. It doesn't, but it tells you something about the desperation that Congress feels in 1875. Because let's be clear, it's been 10 years since the end of the war, and they're still having to enact legislation because it doesn't seem to be sticking in the way that you would assume that, well, you got a 13th Amendment that abolishes slavery. Do you really need a 14th Amendment that extends citizenship? Do you really need a 15th Amendment that say, says you can't abridge the right to vote? Based on, do you really need a force act of 1870 that says this is the penalty if you violate those? You do if you're in the state of Delaware in 1868, you've got a woman discussing 
discovered, who's still being enslaved by her former master who says, oh, I, well, I thought that the, the 13th Amendment was for people born after 1865. Therefore, be it enacted, I gotta read this part to you, and it being the appropriate object of legislation to enact great fundamental principle into law, that perhaps is the difference between that Republican Congress in 1875 thinking about principle. Therefore, being enacted that all persons within the jurisdiction of the United States shall be entitled to the full and equal enjoyment of, help me, advantages, help me, and privileges of, public conveyances on, theater and theaters and other places of public amusement, subject only to the condition and limitations established by law and applicable alike to citizens of every race and color, regardless of any previous condition of servitude. If that law is enacted and if it's followed, then there is no Rosa Parks moment and there are no freedom rides. There's no need for a Civil Rights Act of 1964. People always ask me, why, didn't there, why wasn't there another constitutional amendment? You didn't need a constitutional amendment. What you needed was teeth to enforce what was already established by those constitutional amendments. That's why you only needed a Civil Rights Act and a Voting Rights Act. That's what Lewis is talking about. Um, if we break these things down, guys, it's pretty obvious, but I'll say it to you very quickly. They're just talking about access to places of public accommodations, right? Bathrooms, theaters, inns, those types of things. Hotel, motel, holiday inn, you name it. What ends up happening is that you get this legal challenge that comes in 1883 to the Civil Rights Act of 1875, and the United States Supreme Court in an eight to one decision strikes down the Civil Rights Act of 1875 and declares it unconstitutional. Why do they do that? Well, Justice Brown, or excuse me, Justice Bradley, Brown is, is Plessy, delivers the majority opinion. And he says, look, two things. Number one, we gotta make a distinction between the actions of the state and the actions of private individuals within the state. The 14th Amendment says no state shall make or enforce any law. But if private entities choose to discriminate, not our business. Secondly, he says, when a man has emerged from slavery and by the aid of beneficent legislation has shaken off the inseparable concomitants of that state, there must be some stage in the progress of his elevation when he takes on the rank of what? I need you to think about what he's saying here. 10 years after the war, Here's Justice Bradley going, when are you guys gonna get treated just like everybody else? <laughs> why do you need special, this is 10 years after the war. So we can understand why Congressman John Lewis, almost 100 years later is saying, wait a minute, we played this game before. How'd it turn out for us? Not very well. We played this game before. He continues and ceases to be, I love this language, the special favorite of the laws, when his rights as a citizen or a man are to be protected in the ordinary modes by which other men's rights are protected. There's one dissenter, the great dissenter, from this period at least, before Holmes and Brandeis, John Marshall Harlan. Yes, the same John Marshall Harlan at the sense in Plessy versus Ferguson. Yes, John Marshall Harlan, the sole Southerner on the court, the Kentuckian. Yes, John Marshall Harlan, who is accused of being a Confederate sympathizer. That John Marshall Harlan is the sole dissenter. What does he say? He says, my brethren say that when a man has emerged from slavery and by the aid of beneficent legislation has shaken off the inseparable commonance of that state, there must be some stage in his progress of his elevation when he takes on the rank of mere citizen and ceases to be the special favor of the law. It is, I submit, scarcely just to say that the colored race has ever been the special favorite of the laws. He continues. What the nation through Congress has sought to accomplish in reference to that race is what has already been done in every state of the, of the union for the white race, to secure and protect rights belonging to them as freemen and, and nothing more. Of course, It's not too many years later before you get this case of Plessy versus Ferguson. Not to bore you with that, but I, again, eight to one decision. What does John Marshall Harlan say in this case? Because you all know the background of this for the young people who don't very quickly. 
You have a Louisiana law that's passed in 1890, the Separate Car Act, that says that you can segregate whites and blacks on the uh, railways and other public conveyances in Louisiana. You've got a guy named Homer Plessy, who is, I'm going to say this is going to sound funny to you, but I'm, I'm, I'm not being funny, seven-eighths white. Whatever. Um, it means that he was black, but if you looked at him, you couldn't tell that he was black. He wasn't visibly black, right? And so he gets on this rail car with the idea that what they want to prove is how ridiculous, young people, this law is. If I can't tell by looking at you that you're black, then how can you have a segregation law? That would be silly. And so Homer Plessy gets on the train, rides a couple of stops, stops the conductor and says, I need to talk to you for a second, Junior. Guess what? I'm black. Conductor says, stop the train. I want to be very clear. The train company was in on this because they thought it was stupid because they said, you know what? This is going to keep us from making money. This is not a good model for us to operate. We can't charge colored people for first class fare if they have to sit in a no class. This is not good for us either. So everybody's on board, but the state believes it's a good thing to do. So Homer Plessy is arrested, and this case goes before the United States Supreme Court. The majority says, we think that segregation is fine. It is Justice Harlan again who dissents, and he says, in the eye of the law, there is in this country no superior dominant ruling class of what? I want to say this again because I said it earlier, I just want to make this case that at the core this is really about citizenship. He continues, there is no case here. Our Constitution is colorblind and neither knows nor tolerates classes among citizens. In respect of civil rights, all citizens are equal before the law. The humblest is the peer the most powerful. The arbitrary separation of citizens on the basis of race while they're on a public highway is a badge of servitude, wholly inconsistent with the civil freedom and the equality before the law established by the Constitution. It cannot be justified upon any legal grounds. Here is John Marshall Harlan in 1896 saying, I need to go back and look at the 13th Amendment. I need to go back and look at the 14th Amendment. But I got to go back to Lincoln. I got to go back to where the radical Republicans were in trying to... Did they intend for a society to be half slave and half free? If they did, then they would have been with Jefferson Davis and Alexander Stevens in the Confederacy. This is not what they intended. And the genius of the United States Constitution, one could argue, is that what was the minority opinion in 1883 and 1896 became the majority opinion in Brown versus Board of, Board of Education half century later. Kind of uh, finish up here. He says, what can more certainly perpetuate a feeling of distrust between the races than state enactments which in fact proceed on the ground that colored citizens are so inferior and degraded that they cannot be allowed to sit in the public coaches occupied by white citizens? Is that not the same question that the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King will ask at the March on Washington? Is it not the same question that undergirds the Civil Rights Act of 1964? He concludes, that, as we'll admit, is the real meaning of such legislation. Uh, uh, let me try to pull all this together. Jimmy Baldwin was fond of saying, the world changes according to the way people see it, and if you can alter, even by a millimeter, the way people look at reality, then you can change it. Part of what we need to change is the way that we think about and talk about the civil rights movement. Part of what we need to do is to start to conceptualize it in a way that Jacqueline Dowd Hall does, not as this singular set of events that takes place between Brown versus Board of Education and the assassination of Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, but a much longer struggle, a struggle that extends back to the Civil War and Reconstruction. Because really, in some sense, what the Civil Rights Movement is, is the second Civil War. It is fighting to regain those rights which blacks won and then lost in the immediate aftermath of the Civil War. Say that to you because when we think about the Civil Rights Movement, our focus is almost singularly Southern. We think about the states of the Deep South. We talk about Mississippi, Alabama, Louisiana. We rarely talk about the North. We forget that the Black Panther Party started in California. We forget that Malcolm X made his bread and butter in the streets of New York. We forget that the Nation of Islam's uh, a base of strength was in Chicago. There's a struggle in the North. There's a great book by Matthew Countryman about Philadelphia called Up South. There's a great book, book by Martha Biondi on the civil rights movement in New York called To Stand and Fight in New York. Uh, 
I wrote a book on New Haven, which original title was No Haven. And the editor was like, nobody's going to get it. You think you're funny, no one else does. Change the title. So it became Black Politics, White Power, but the argument was the same, that there are these northern communities that are experiencing problems that are very similar, but because we don't talk about that, we have reduced this struggle, we've reduced this history to something that has no meaning and relevance for young people today. I want to read to you very quickly Jacqueline Dowd, Hall, ja Jacqueline Dowd Hall's thesis, because this is her critique of the way that we talk about the civil rights movement. Number one, by confining the civil rights struggle to the South. Secondly, to a single halcyon decade, our narrative is 54 to 68. Even though we know that nothing ever begins or ends that neatly. The NAACP is founded in 1909 on the heels of the Springfield race riot. Now, talk to somebody about this today. There's a Niagara movement that uh, W.E.V. Du Bois is involved in. It's primarily an all-black movement, and they're kind of doing their own thing. But it's not until Mary White Ovington and Joel Spingiron and Arthur Spingiron witness the violence in Lincoln's birthplace that they go, wait a minute, I'm going to say this slowly, but John Marshall Harlan had said it just a few years earlier. What was this war that we fought about if it wasn't about ensuring that we weren't going to have violence in American cities because people were expecting the same rights of citizenship that are freely offered to everyone and not to the colored, not to the Negro, not to African Americans. And so you then link up that energy, the Niagara movement, with what will become the National Association for the Advancement of Color, uh, Association for the Advancement of Color People, and you get the creation of this powerful civil rights organization, which through the 1920s and the 1930s and the 1940s is going to combat the six degrees of segregation. Where are they going to do that? In the courtroom with Thurgood Marshall arguing for uh, non-segregated education, arguing for due process of law. Because we disconnect this movement, because we don't talk about it or teach about it in these ways, we forget the Scottsboro Boys. We forget Murray versus Maryland. We forget all these early contests, all these battles that were taking shape in the 20s, 30s, and 40s that laid the basis for the victories in the 1950s and 1960s. Keep in mind, it was an NAACP legal strategy that resulted in Brown, not a decision one day for some black kids down in South Carolina and in Kansas and Washington, D.C. to say, we don't like segregation anymore. It was a long process. She continues. We limit our discussion of civil rights to limited non-economic objectives. We talk about the movement as if it was only about the right to vote. This is the crime in the way that Obama's election was framed. Because the arc of the movement was electing a, an African-American president. If that were the case, then when we elected Richard Hatcher in Indiana, or when we elected should I even go through the list? Harold Washington in Chicago, or we elected Maynard Jackson, or insert black public official here, Harold Washington, then that should have resulted in, but it's never resulted in that because the issues are far more fundamental. They are about citizenship at their core. They're about community control of school boards. They're about access to public housing. They're about ensuring those things that we as a society should be very clear at this point, no public official can deliver without a clear buy-in from communities that are empowered to be part of those solutions. When I say that, I want to be clear that she's saying that the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King shortly before his death, think about what he writes in his book, Where Do We Go From Here? His final book, Where Do We Go From Here? Chaos or Community. What is he doing in 1968? He's leading a poor people's campaign to Washington, D.C. It is a multiracial, multi-ethnic campaign, and it is a desire to end poverty. Because King writes in his final book, what I realized is that we made a grievous error in the way that we were going after our goal early on in this movement, that we talked about the right to vote, that we talked about race, and what we didn't do was deal with the fact that what good is it to have the right to eat in a restaurant if you can't afford anything on the menu? Civil rights without economic justice are dead rights. What good is it to have the right to go to college if you can't afford tuition? Civil rights without economic justice is dead. She concludes, the problem with this narrative is that it ensures the status of the classical phase as a triumphal movement in a larger American progress narrative, yet it undermines its gravitas. It prevents one of the most remarkable mass movements in American history from speaking effectively to the challenges of our time. Let me be clear. Do we still have challenges with poverty? Yes. Do we still have challenges with voting? 
So really what she's saying, and I think she nails it here, is that what we've done is undercut the significance of this movement by segmenting it and talking about it as if they exist in different planes. What did people believe that Abraham Lincoln was going to deliver as president in 1860? 61. What was Lincoln talking about in 1864 in his second inaugural? The one thing that she doesn't say clearly here is that we limit our discussion to boulderized heroes. A lot of the people that we talk about have feet of clay. Martin Luther King wasn't perfect. Abraham Lincoln wasn't perfect. I'm not perfect. There aren't any perfect people. There are simply people who are committed to justice who will do anything like Congressman John Lewis. There are simply people who are committed to justice who will do anything like Spotswood Rice. There are simply people who are committed to justice like Rosa Parks, like Ida B. Wells, like insert famous person here, who do the right thing because it's the right thing to do and aren't concerned about the consequences and aren't worried about what somebody's going to say or how somebody's going to perceive them. They just know that justice and democracy demands action. That's what it means to be in our DNA. It ain't about Alabama. You could tell the whole story of the civil rights movement through Alabama, but it's not about Alabama. It's about Brooklyn. African-American woman in a protest in what year? 1964 in Brooklyn, New York, being arrested for civil rights demonstration. We have to tell those stories. We have to connect it to Springfield in some realistic way. We've got to talk about how these things are connected, what they call us to remember. And we have to do it in a way that allows us to do a little bit of historical fingerprinting. For our young people to be able to see an image like this and understand that the point that the cartoonist is making isn't just that there's a, a black president at the front of the bus. It's that there was this long struggle that involved access to places of public, uh, pl public accommodation and education that this victory symbolically in 2008 we thought was going to solve. And it didn't. It didn't even come close. Trayvon Martin proves it didn't come close. I love this cartoon. We talk about historical fingerprinting. We have to understand and make those connections. We talk about Jim Crow justice. That, and I love this for young people, whether the injustice is delivered by men that come in white hoods in the cover of night and the instrument of injustice they use to deliver that is the, is the noose, and they cover or mask their identity because they felt they were hunted by the government, or whether that injustice is delivered by men who wear black robes. Because remember in Illinois, <laughs> remember what happened with the, the capital punishment and death penalty here. Don't feel bad. New Jersey, Delaware, Texas all have a day of reckoning coming. Because this is the problem when we don't deal honestly with the history. This is the problem when we don't talk about young people, when we don't sell you on the idea that the price of freedom is eternal vigilance that no generation gets off the hook by saying all the victories are won and we don't have to be concerned about these things because they don't involve us anymore. The issue of racial profiling, when I show this to students, they sometimes go, oh, I know what this is. This is racial profiling of Arab Americans because this is Mumia Abu-Jamal. No, Mumia Abu-Jamal was the Black Panther from Philadelphia who was accused of killing a Philadelphia police officer and he's been an international call celeb for that. He was on death row for many years. But what I say to young people is, you know, blot him out and insert other image here. We know that racial profiling and trying to deal with our, our fears about crime by targeting one particular group in this way hasn't strengthened our democracy, it's weakened it. It's made us vulnerable. I love this cartoon because the cartoonist was trying to make the case that in Selma 1965 was the second crossing of the Delaware by Washington. The second American Revolution. I love that for young people because you got to understand what the original American Revolution was about. And at its core, it was about, and I want to say this slowly, citizenship. What are you talking about, Dr. Williams? I don't get that. What do you mean? No taxation without representation ultimately is about if I'm a citizen of England, then how can you deny me the opportunity to participate in the government in which I am represented, but you claim that representation is virtual? That makes no sense. That is something that I'm willing to fight for. I love this cartoon because it makes the case very clearly 
that the civil rights movement in the 1950s and 1960s is a second civil war. There was the battle during the civil war of the ironclads, the monitor and the Merrimack. And this recreates that with Virginia's massive resistance and federal court desegregation orders. At the end of the day, all of these cartoonists are playing with a history, and I want to be very clear, that our young people are woefully unaware of. And it's partly because we won't make the connection for them. We're afraid to make the connection. It's rare that you come to a place like the Lincoln home where those connections are made and you can actually go, they're doing it right here. This is how it needs to be done. But yet most places you go, it's just about whatever figure or whatever moment it represents. And therein lies the problem that our history has just become a series of episodes like television shows that are unconnected and have no long, no long arc that connects them. I'll say this to you in the end. Look, we talk about Jim Crow justice and lynching and 50 shots and Jaywalk, kids getting punched in the face for jaywalking. These are Black Panthers being strip searched on the streets of Philadelphia in 1967, 68. How does that happen? We look at New York and we talk about Amadou Diallo, 41 shots. Patrick Doorsman killed, 2000. Timothy Stansbury, Sean Bell. Had a long history. There's a great hip hop song called Sound of the Police. In that song, you have Karis, one who has this line. My great grandfather had to deal with the cops. My great grandfather had to deal with the cops. My great grandfather had to deal with the cops. And my great, 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 when is going to stop? He also has this wonderful line in the song where he goes, overseer, 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 officer, 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 officer. Now look. If we want our kids to develop a healthy respect for law enforcement, if we want to try to really deal with some of these problems, then we've got to talk about these conditions in our community that allow these things to persist. And a lot of that, a large part of that's going to be dealing with this history. I'm going to say this to you too. Um, I'm, going to, I'm running out of time. Skip both of these. I want to go here. Reconstruction. I, I want to end with you by talking about this image and a quote that comes from this image. This cartoon was produced in 1863, and it is meant to... Uh, Poke fun at the problem that's posed by the Emancipation Proclamation. And the joke is, congratulations, Mr. Lincoln and Republican Party. You just emancipated four and a half million people who used to be slaves. Now what? What's their economic status going to be in a new republic? What's their political status going to be? What's their social status going to be? You haven't decided any of that. You just said Emancipation Proclamation. And let's be clear, you got Spotswood Rice in 1864 already projecting what that means when he's telling Kitty Diggs, First telling his children, we're to be general by a general that will give me both of you. And then telling Kitty Diggs, you will then know how to talk to me and talk right too. And then saying this whole government gives cheer to me and you cannot help yourself. So they've unleashed forces, which in some sense the cartoonist is saying, the man who won the elephant at the raffle, but the question is, what am I to do with the creature? What it is, is what... I like to call one of these, there goes my everything moments. And I take this from the work of a historian named Jason Sokol, who wrote a book called, There Goes My Everything, White Southerners in the Age of Civil Rights, 1945 to 1975. Two things I want to point out very quickly. Note how Sokol is pushing the boundaries of how we describe the civil rights movement. It's not that single halcyon decade, uh, 54 to 68. He's saying, we got to go back to World War II, right? And we got to push it into the 1970s. But beyond that, I want to tell you the thesis of this book. It's a great thesis. It's a long book, but get to the essence in just a couple sentences. Sokol says this. White Southerners went to bed in 1945, and the world looked one way. No Negroes playing baseball. No Truman desegregating the military. No civil rights plank in the Democratic Party. Then they woke up literally the next day, and literally, there goes my everything. Everything that I used to know, everything that I thought about myself and my place in this society has now been brought into question, and now what? That's a pretty powerful... We want to understand the resurgence of the Ku Klux Klan in the period just before the Civil Rights Movement. That's the resurgence of the Ku Klux Klan. We understand the Southern Fire Eaters and what uh, projects Black Monday in the aftermath of, this, of the Brown versus Board of Education decision, where you got... George Wallace and others, even as late as 1960, talk about segregation today, segregation tomorrow, segregation forever. Where does that come from? From these there goes my everything moments. Let me be clear because sometimes it loses young people. Because I would say that the same thing happened in 1865. That Americans went to bed and the world looked one way and they got 
I'd say the same thing happened to us in 2001. 9-11. Because when I went to bed on September 10th, the world looked one way. I thought I knew when I was going to retire. I thought I knew who our enemies were. I thought I'd always be able to pull up to the Philadelphia airport and run through it like OJ. Bad reference. Remember those days? Remember those days when the gate closed and it was not this two hours, no liquid? Remember the good old days? There goes my everything. Because I don't know when I'll retire. I don't know when our boys are going to come home. I don't know what the future, do you guys follow where I'm going here? I'm driving in from Bloomington and I'm seeing the signs along the road to talk about soy, soy, soybean oil being the, the answer to Middle Eastern. And I'm saying to myself, these are important connections for our young people to be able to make. They've got to understand them. Why am I saying in this context? There is one person who tries to answer this question. It's Frederick Douglass. I'm going to end on this note. 1960, excuse me, 1865, April of 1865, Douglass is invited to the Massachusetts Anti-Slavery Society, and they want to ask him to answer one question, and that question is, what shall we do with the Negro? What does the Negro want? Same question here. And so Douglas begins a speech in 1865. I've got to read this to you, and then I'm, I'm definitely going to end. But I'm going to say this to you. Douglas is going to foreshadow the next 100 years of U.S. history. What does Douglas say? What shall we do with the Negro? I've had but one answer from the beginning. Do nothing with us. Your doing with us has already played the mischief with us. Do nothing with us. If the apples will not remain on the tree of their own strength, if they are worm-eaten at the core, if they're early ripe and disposed to fall, let them fall. I'm not for tying or fasting them on the tree in any way except by nature's plans. And if they will not stay there, let them fall. And if the Negro cannot stand on his own legs, let him fall also. It's kind of strange because here you've got Frederick Douglass giving you a little social Darwinism. But why wouldn't he? Because he's a contemporary of Herbert Spencer and Charles Darwin. So why are we so surprised to find Darwinian or social Darwinian thought in Frederick Douglass? But he says, and this is important, all I ask is give him a chance to stand on his own legs. Let him alone. Love this. If you see him on his way to, this is 1865. This is 1865. This is Douglas saying, there's no Brown versus Board of Education yet. There's no... Uh, Ross Barnett or, or George Wallace standing in the schoolhouse door. There's no authoring Lucy. There's none of that. But here's Douglas saying, but if you don't, if, if you proceed in the way that I perceive that you will proceed, these are the problems that you will create and it will hurt us as a society. It will undermine us and it will be damning to us. He continues, if you see him on his way to school, let him alone. Don't disturb him. If you see him going to the at a these are the sit-ins. These are the sit-ins. Let him go. If you see him going to the what? If you see him going to vote, Douglas is not only articulating those six degrees of segregation I told you about, he's literally foreshadowing the next 100 years. And he's interrupted at this point by applause because the people in that Massachusetts audience are saying to themselves, yup, that sounds about right to us. He concludes, if you see him going into a... If you see him trying to work, just let him go. Your interference is doing him a positive injury. General Banks' preparation is of a piece with an attempt to prop up the Negro. Let him fall if he cannot stand alone. If the Negro cannot live by the line of eternal justice, so beautifully pictured to you in the illustration used by Mr. Phillips, the fault will not be yours. It will be he who made the Negro and established that line for his government. Interrupted by applause again. If they fail, if we fail, and you've done nothing to molest the process, and this is the way that it was meant to be. But if you interfere, you bear the cross for the sins that will come. He concludes, let him live or die by that. If you will only untie his hands and give him a chance, I think he will live. But we know that no sooner is the ink dry in the 13th Amendment and the 14th Amendment, no sooner is the ink dry in the 15th Amendment that those same six degrees of segregation I told you about earlier come into four. We know that they express themselves in housing and education and public accommodations, voting rights, 
unfair labor practices, Jim Crow justice. We see them in these major battles of the second civil war. If we look at Montgomery, what does it begin with? An altercation over public accommodation and then Rosa Parks is arrested, Jim Crow justice, right? You can look at it in Little Rock, Arkansas that begins with the battle over education, right? We can look at it in the Freedom Rides, which is about public accommodations, but it's going to take us into education and voting rights because they're going to try to register people to vote as they're doing this. And then they're going to deal with Jim Crow justice because they're going to wind up in parchment prison for trying to do something that the United States Supreme Court had said they could do at this point. We could look at it in Birmingham or Freedom Summer or Selma or Chicago in 66 or the Meredith March Against Fear. And all we would be doing is showing what her block showed in 1963 in this wonderful cartoon. And remember, nothing can be accomplished by taking to the streets. And yet in that cartoon, her block, what is he pointing to? Housing, school, public accommodations, job opportunities. He's in conversation with Douglas. One last example, then I'm going to let you go. The best example that I can give you for the reason that we got to make this a long struggle is embodied in a speech that Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King gives on the eve of the Montgomery bus boycott. And I like the speech because this is not one of his often quoted speeches. But Rosa Parks has just been arrested and they convince young Martin King, 26-year-old Martin King, to be the leader of this protest. And so he got to give a speech and he's got three, four hours to prepare. And so this is the speech that he gives. I love it. But we are here in a specific sense because of the bus situation in Montgomery. Listen to what he says. We are here because we are determined to get the situation corrected. But then he says something powerful. This situation is not at all what? The problem has existed over endless years. For many years now, Negroes in Montgomery and so many other areas have been inflicted with paralysis of a crippling fear on buses in our community. On so many occasions, Negroes have been intimidated and humiliated and oppressed because of the sheer fact they were Negroes. I don't have time this evening to go into the what? I'm going to say this again, but he knew the history. And he could have gone into the history. And our young people don't know the history. And so therefore, these encounters to them seem divorced from anything substantive. And it's just, oh, it's just that site over there, and just this book, and just this description. And no one ever connects the dots and says, this is why you should care, and this is how it impacts you, and this is why these things matter. This is what you're safeguarding. Uh, I would tell you this story about the fact that Rosa Parks wasn't the first person to give up her seat. It was this young girl, Claudette Colvin. Not going to tell you that story because Claudette Colvin wasn't the first. I can go all the way back to the period of the 1860s and I can show you, tell you about a case that happened with a woman named Mary Miles in the Philadelphia and Westchester Railroads. In Philadelphia, the Cradle of Liberty, 1867, you have the case of a black woman who's refused to give, who refuses to give up her seat on a railroad, who sues, wins, and then has that reversed by the Supreme Court of her state. I could talk about what's going on in Memphis in 1868, where it's news in the papers that Negroes are riding cars. I can talk about Washington, D.C., where this cartoon is produced that shows a respectable black woman being assaulted on the train by a poor uh, white woman. And the caption for all these could read, the problem is, as King said, I don't have time this evening to go into the history, but it's a long history. So let me tell you this story, and I'll end here. One of the first people who refused to give up her seat is this woman here, Elizabeth Jennings. She refuses to do so in 1854 in New York City. And we have her deposition. So let me share that with you and then we'll be done. So this is what happens to her. And I want to say it again, 1854 New York City. Sarah E. Adams and myself walked down to the corner of Pearl and Chapman Streets to take the Third Avenue cars. I held up my hand to the driver and he stopped the cars and we got on a platform when the conductor told us to wait for the next car. I told him as I could, I could not wait as I was in a hurry to go to church. Got to say something to my young people here. People don't get up in the morning and go, I'm going to make history today. People get up in the morning and they're going about their business and injustice finds them and they go, I refuse to be a victim of injustice. But in order to do that, you have to be prepared. You have to know your history. You have to believe in the, in the fundamental values that undergird this country. That's part of the deal. That's part of the bargain. So that when it happens, you know intuitively, because then your DNA, I'm not standing for that. She continues. He then told me the other car had my people in it and that it was appropriated for that purpose. I then told him I had no people. 
It was no particular occasion. I wish to go to churches I've been going for the last six months and I did not wish to be detained. I love this. She continues. He insisted upon my getting off the car, but I did not get off the car. He said I should come out or he would put me out. I told him not to lay his hands on me. He took hold of me and I took hold of the window sash and held on. He pulled me until he broke my grasp and I took hold of his coat and held on to that. He also broke my grasp. And from that, but he had previously dragged my companion out. She all the while screaming for him to let go. He then ordered the driver to fasten his horses, which he did, and come help him put me out of the car. They then both seized hold of me by my arms and pulled and dragged me flat down on the bottom of the platform so that my feet hung one way and my head the other nearly on the ground. I screamed murder with all my voice and my companion screamed out, you'll kill her, don't kill her, because she wants to go to church in New York City in 1854. The driver then let go of me and went to his horses. I went again in the car. <laughs> it's over at this point. She's out. And yet, at that moment, she says, now it's a question of principle. As a... As a... As a citizen, I shouldn't be treated this way. The driver then let go of me and went to his horses, and I went again in the car, and the conductor said, you shall sweat for this. Sweat young people are turned back then. I mean, you're going to go to jail. They called it sweating because there's no air conditioning. So they put you in the tombs in New York City and you literally sweat. You will sweat for this. This is the six degrees of segregation. Begins with an encounter on a trolley car. I just like to sit and go to church. No, you can't sit and go to church. Now you're going to go to jail, right? Mm -hmm. Continues. This always gets me. Uh, anyway, continues. He then told the driver to drive as fast as he could not take another passenger to the car to drive until he saw an officer or a station house. They got an officer in the corner of Walker and Bowery whom the conductor told, listen, that his orders from the agent were to admit colored passengers, persons if the passengers did not object, but if they did not to let them ride. What you have in New York City in 1854 is what we call de facto segregation. It's not by law, it's by custom. They're supposed to ask. The, did the conductor ever ask? No. Love this. She concludes. When the officer took me, there were some eight or ten persons in the car. Then the officer, without listening to anything I had to say, thrust me out and then pushed me and tauntingly told me to get redressed if I could. The officer denied me due process. So she sued. Let me say this slowly. And she won. She won a judgment in 1854 in New York. The irony is that what should have happened as a result of the Civil War is that what happened in New York City should have become the norm. Mm -hmm. And instead, in the aftermath of the Civil War, it is what Johnson later describes as two societies, separate and unequal, divided by color. We talk about the shadow of Lincoln. Part of what we need to do is understand that this long history will involve us talking about the ways in which our society is both imperfect and has the capacity to grow that the issue of states' rights didn't die with the Civil War, that when uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt was refusing to deal with the issue of lynching in 1937, the Richmond Planet said, this is a sample of states' rights. The uh, states can lynch, and the federal government can't pass an anti-lynching bill to protect the lives of U.S. citizens. We need to understand that when Dwight David Eisenhower is refusing, in some sense, to, to act, and the question is, what are you going to do? The nation's in flames in terms of civil rights. And the response is, you know, tis, tis, somebody should do something about this. And Eisenhower won't respond. And you've got literally kids, citizens, children whose lives are at risk in Little Rock. Then it's important for us to talk about citizenship. And so we conclude today with a young person, because I spent all this time talking about how this stuff impacts young people. So let's end with the young person. Melba Patillo Beals in her book, Warriors Don't Cry. She was one of the Little Rock Nine, and I, I want to use this to end because this is the price for the unexamined life, the unexamined democracy. So what does she say? She kept a diary. How strange I thought to be involved in something the whole nation considers among its 10 most important stories. If it's that important, you'd think somebody would do something to make the Central High students behave themselves. Is it that nobody cares or nobody knows what to do? Even little Melba 
can understand that sometimes people are just paralyzed by inaction. That sometimes they're just waiting for somebody to lead out, for somebody to show the right example, for somebody to take a stand based on principle, for somebody to act consistent with the values of a nation, for somebody to show some moral courage, for some, I'm sorry, I was talking to you guys, uh, for somebody to move into those intersections and to believe that a just democracy is possible. She continues, by New Year's Eve, I thought only about Central High perhaps every other hour. Why? Because she's a kid and we've all been there and you guys are there right now where your whole life is what's going on at school and her school time is dealing with this craziness. By New Year's Eve, I only thought about Central High every other hour. So on New Year's Eve 1958, I sat home completing my list of New Year's resolutions. Number one, to do my best to stay alive until May 29th. May 29th being the end of the? Two, to pray daily for the strength not to. Easy to talk about Martin Luther King and the philosophy of nonviolence, but to hear it from this young girl. Number three, to keep faith and understand more of how Gandhi behaved when his life was really hard. Because it's one thing for me to say to young people, you need to know the history, and it's another thing for them to hear it out of the mouth of a young girl who knows who Gandhi and the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King are because, and Daisy Bates, because she's in the midst of that struggle. Because in making a stand for justice, it became important for her to understand why she was acting in this way. And you're never too young to move into the intersections to challenge injustice. You just aren't. Last three, I'm gonna read quickly. To behave in a way that pleases mother and grandma, to maintain the best attitude I can at school, to help grandma India with her work, and then last but not least, to help Minnie Jean remain in school and be a better friend to her. Pretty remarkable, out of the mouth of babes. There goes my everything moments can only impact us negatively if we refuse to act, if we refuse to connect the dots of our history. One of the people that responded to the white David Eisenhower's failure to deal with Little Rock in a timely fashion was Jackie Robinson. 1958, Jackie Robinson writes to the president, my dear Mr. President, now this isn't Jackie Robinson's fight. You're playing baseball, everybody loves you. You helped the Dodgers win a championship. You can stay out of this. Jackie writes to the president, I was sitting in the audience at the summit meeting of Negro leaders yesterday when you said we must be patient. On hearing you say this, I felt like standing up and saying, oh no, not again. I, res I respectfully remind you, sir, that we've been the most patient of all people. When you said we must have self-respect, I wondered how we must have self-respect and remain patient considering the treatment accorded us through the years. 17 million Negroes cannot do as you suggest and wait for the hearts of men to change. We want to enjoy now the rights that we feel we are entitled to as Americans, as citizens. That's the shadow of Lincoln. That's the connection. Thank you for your indulgence this evening. We're done. Thank you.